Presidential elections in Egypt are set to begin on December 10th. How has incumbent Abdul Fatel Sisi established dominance? The Turkish Medical Association is facing yet another round of repression. Why is the government targeting this body of doctors and medical professionals? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And before we go any further, please hit the subscribe button. Presidential elections in Egypt will be held from December 10 to 12th and everything points to a third term for President Abdul Fattah el-Sisi who came to power in 2014. Now, Egypt's condition has deteriorated on multiple fronts during the Sisi years. However, his vice-like grip on state institutions means that no other candidate stands even a sliver of a chance. The elections take place as Egypt also continues to play a role in the Israeli blockade of Gaza. We go to Abdul for more. Abdul, there's a lot happening in the region as Egypt heads for its election. Uh, but of course, uh, Abdul Fatel Sisi, uh, unsurprisingly, uh, seems to be the leading candidate, of course. So maybe first, could you take us through what is the general election scenario in the country before we go to his legacy and stuff? Well, uh, the elections are scheduled uh, from 10th to 12th. Uh, so results will be out on uh, 18th. But the results are all, uh, as you rightly pointed out, are well known. It, it seems that CC is up out of these four candidates, uh, including CC. Uh, he is uh, going to be win the elections. Everyone, there is no doubt about it. Uh, there are other three candidates which have been allowed uh, to contest against him. One is, of course, Farid Zaran, who has been active uh, in whatever opposition is remaining in the country. Uh, he's the member of Egypt Egyptian Social Democratic Party, and he has also uh, been one of the active uh, founders of the civil democratic movement, which basically is whatever, uh, as I said before, the opposition uh, is allowed inside the country. And he was the leader of that. So because of that, uh, the the movements uh, in in the country as also are is, is also divided, whether uh, they should boycott the election or they should participate in. So, but majority of them, of course, are boycotting the election. Have given the call, but uh, a, a part of it uh, which earlier had decided to boycott uh, because uh, Ahmed Tantavi, one of the major uh, candidates uh, from the left, uh, basically was. Uh, uh, not allowed to uh, contest elections. The the endorsement which is required when um, the army and the election election commission in the country there is the allegation that they force them and uh, the people not to basically uh, give the endorsement to him, and therefore that led to ultimately him withdrawing from the candidacy. Candidacy. The other two, Abdul uh, San, uh, Sanad uh, Yamama, is a member of the Waft Party. And he is, of course, the oldest party in the country, but uh, has no popular base at this moment. And the third one is Hazem Omar, uh, a representative of the Republican People's Party. So these are the four candidates, uh, including CC, which are contesting. And um, the, the, of course, the campaign is uh, ongoing. But uh, if you see what is happening on the ground, only CC is visible. The rest of the candidates have no visibility. And it seems that uh, the results are already decided. Right, Abdul, uh, good time to maybe look back at what Abdul Sisi, uh, Fatih al Sisi has meant for Egypt. Uh, I believe it's 10 years now since, uh, you know, he has come to dominate the power, uh, uh, the, the power center, so to speak. So how do we sort of see where Egypt is under him right now? Well, uh, Egypt at this moment, apart from the political uh, situation, which is, of course, one of the worst in the world uh, in com when it comes to uh, freedom, when it comes to the right uh, 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 of the opposition parties, uh, the human rights groups, even the uh, civil rights movements are not allowed to function. There are thousands of activists who are inside prison at this moment. So apart from the political uh, situation, uh, for a very long time, the labor movement was not allowed to function freely. Even if the emergency law was withdrawn a few years back, uh, they are still not allowed to do uh, the basic uh, uh, work which a trade union uh, should do. Strike is not legal, protests are not legal, and so on and so forth. Even the protest in support of Palestine uh, w w 
are not allowed at this moment in Egypt. Apart from the political situation, of course, if you see the eco- uh, economy wise, Egypt is also not doing great. In fact, Egypt is considered to be the second country after Ukraine, which is which may uh, default and go bankrupt uh, uh, by the international monetary organizations. It is also running on uh, the loans extended by the IMF. And because of those conditionalities imposed by, imposed by IMF, the state subsidies, which were the backbone for the majority of the Egyptian poor, are also gradually withdrawn. So Egyptian people, uh, including the uh, the, uh, the middle classes, are not in any good shape at this moment. The living standards are going down for a very long time. The prices of essential commodities are going up. And amidst all that, uh, the extravagance of the ruling classes, the military, uh, continues. So uh, at this moment, both politically and economically, Egypt is in a very bad shape. But despite all those, uh, if you see the performance, by, despite all that, uh, there is no doubt that CC is going to... Uh, be the victorious, be victorious, and maybe he get more than ninety six percent vote, as has been the case in the last two elections. Uh, we should wait and see. Yeah. Not to mention fact that he did bring about a constitutional amendment, which sort of uh, further cements his hold on power as well. But Abdul, at this point, also wanted to ch- ask you about, you know, what Egypt has uh, become, so to speak, internationally, because we are also talking about a time when Egypt, for many years. Egypt has, of course, maintained that blockade on Gaza, which a lot of people are questioning right now. So, how has Egypt sort of positioned itself internationally, especially with respect to some of the bigger players in the region? Well, uh, there are contradictory uh, signals if you read uh, Egypt's foreign policy in the last few years. Of course, it is one of the closest allies to the US, has remained so. Uh, its military continued continues to get uh, aid, whatever aid support, billions of dollars from the U.S. Uh, And since the military uh, is by default is the ruling uh, uh, class in the country, of course, the foreign policy would be shaped accordingly. And that's what is reflected. So uh, though on one front, it continues to support uh, uh, U.S. policies in the region, continues to, of course, not directly, but indirectly, in a way, provides support to Israeli oppressive regime, regimes in Gaza. As you rightly pointed out, the blockade is imposed with, with cooperation with Egypt uh, uh, in, uh, in Gaza. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, it is the only source through which Egyptian, uh, sorry, uh, Palestinians are allowed to have some kind of humanitarian assistance. Uh, the Rafah border is the only border which is open and through which uh, the aid, the essential aid, is basically passing through. Apart from that, you also see that Egypt recently has also uh, become the uh, a member of BRICS. Uh, it is going to join uh, BRICS in, in January, and that basically is a, a grouping which, of course, uh, does not fit into the American cal- the U.S. calculations, uh, not only for the reason for the global politics. And, and that basically, that's what I was saying, that this, this Egypt at this moment is giving very uh, contradictory uh, uh, signals when it comes to foreign policy. I think that is also a reflection of the larger uh, 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 con- uh, condition in the entire region. No country has is remain has remained uh, to the traditional uh, uh, role it was it was assigned to because of the uh, uh, you can say interventions made by uh, uh, or the confidence given by the uh, what we call the rise of China in the region and across the world. The, these countries are, have started, to some extent, of course, uh, asserting their uh, 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 independence uh, in foreign policy. And that's what uh, is the reason I can read is the uh, uh, behind this confusing or contradictory uh, foreign policy, uh, which Egypt and other Arab countries have been following in recent days. Yeah. Thank you so much, Abdul, for analysis. We'll come back when the results are announced. For a long time, the Turkish Medical Association has been a target of the country's government. Though the body is a pillar of civil society and has intervened in key moments as a forum of medical professionals, its independent position on issues has meant that it has been attacked relentlessly. 
Now a court verdict has dissolved the Central Committee of the Association. We go to Anna Brachar to understand the nature of attacks on this professional body. Anna, thank you so much for joining us. So we've been following the case of the Turkish Medical Association. We have talked about it in previous episodes as well. So could you maybe first take us through what is the latest attack that has happened on this important body of doctors and physicians in Turkey? Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, at the end of November, uh, a court uh, decided to um, to dissolve the central committee, the central council of the Turkish Medical Association, and that's of course the outcome of months long uh, legal struggle which the government through the courts has been waging against uh, against the association. Uh, we do know that the Turkish Medical Association is quite specific in this context because it's a very progressive organization. It has stood up for workers' rights, uh, not only for professional rights, but for uh, the the workplace rights in hospitals and uh, primary health healthcare centers in Turkey for a very long time. Uh, they have also been very strong advocates for peace. Uh, they have never remained silent as Turkey was going through a very difficult period of time, uh, continues to do so. So uh, it's essentially uh, an organization that uh, has a very uh, important uh, impact on democracy and democratic life in Turkey, on uh, so um, on the right uh, on on the right to free speech, uh, and is essentially has been working in solidarity with other movements for a very long for a very very long time, and unsurprisingly, because of that, they have been per, uh, uh, prosecuted uh, on uh, different occasions. Uh, if we look back at uh, a year ago, uh, their president, uh, Shebnem Korur Finanje, uh, who is also uh, a very respected doctor, forensic uh, specialist, uh, was in jail, was, uh, was imprisoned uh, for statements made on uh, on a public broadcast, essentially only calling for neutral uh, assessment of uh, of uh, of a situation um, at the border with northern Iraq uh, and uh, alleged attacks and use of uh, of chemical weapons against the against uh, the people from the uh, so from uh, from the Kurdish uh, so for, from the Kurdish from the Kurdish movement. Right, and in this context, of course, I think important to also remind our readers why. The Turkish Medical Association is an important body. You mentioned, of course, one instance, but can you also maybe take us through the scope of uh, their work? What are some of the uh, you know actions they're involved in? Why are they an important body for Turkey? Well, uh, you know, we can uh, we can take an, a number of examples. Essentially, they've been very active in supporting uh, various various uh, initiatives. Uh, one of the things that you know has to be highlighted is that they were one of the first organizations to respond to the earthquakes that hit Turkey and northern Syria, uh, and Syria, sorry, uh, earlier this year. So they were among those leading the response as the government and as the gov uh, as the ministry response lagged behind. Of course, you know they were they they were met with a devastating situation. They were talking about uh, seeing their uh, their comrades in the rubble. Uh, they were talking about working in places that they know they knew from before were unsafe, were not supposed to be built on, and yet yet again you you could find hospitals hospitals in those areas. So there's a whole spectrum of actions that they did uh, in in that line of action, but. Then, on the other hand, um, they have also been very vocal critics about the effects of commodification and of privatization of healthcare in Turkey. So this has ranged from collecting data about uh, health workers who were applying to leave the country because of the uh, of the devastating uh, working conditions. Uh, to you know, organizing strikes and organizing uh, direct action that points out to what what the years of privatization in Turkey uh, have done to to access to healthcare. Although it might not be uh, such a hot topic to discuss, in, and maybe it's not as present as uh, as it ought to be. So, uh, and of course, you know, if we look at years uh, years before, they they were. Uh, Let's put it that way. Uh, a lot of the members from the Turkish Medical Associations were also co-signatories of uh, the Academics for Peace, Peace Initiative, which led to a mass persecution of academics uh, in Turkey uh, just for supporting peace. So uh, these are people who have been very brave over the past years. They have not been intimidated by very, uh, very violent actions taken by, by the government against them. And even as the court has made this decision to dissolve the Central C Council of the Turkish Medical Association, they have already said that they would not back, out, uh, back away and that they, they would continue to fight for what they have been fighting for before. And then finally, of course, maybe could you take us through what the global 
uh, health activist communi community, how has it sort of responded, not just to this specific instance, but the kind of so solidarity and support they have provided in the past as well? Uh, well, understandably, you know, because we're talking about such a specific uh, organization, which is very well known ar around the world and specifically in, um, in these professional circles, uh, they have been met with, the case has been met with solidarity, both internationally, but also in Turkey. Hundreds, uh, more than 100 uh, of organizations inside Turkey have signed a solidarity statement with the Turkish Medical Association, pointing out that, you know, a strike against them, it's not only a strike against the, the medical profession, it's also a strike against uh, healthcare is also a strike against the democratic procedures and how how civil society is supposed to function. And then, of course, we should add that uh, international organizations, including Physicians for uh, for Human Rights, have also supported and have been supportive uh, f with the Turkish Medical Associations for months now. Anna, thank you so much for that analysis. We'll come back to you as more developments take place on this case. That's all we have in today's episode. We'll be back tomorrow for another episode. In the meanwhile, do visit our website, peoplesdispatch.org and follow us on all the social media platforms.